periodically we'd like to present another view on current events. There are a number of issues we'd like to discuss today, which are currently before the public. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. Just recently, throughout the United States, there was a syndicated column called Jingling Coins Lost Faith. The focus of the article uh, was some of the scandals that have rocked the post-Vatican II Church. With me today to discuss and present another view is Father William Jenkins. Father Jenkins is a priest who has and is continuing to hold fast to the traditions and who celebrates the traditional Latin Mass exclusively. Father Jenkins, this is a, an idea or a theme we've come back to several times over the last 10 years. And it's this, the, 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 the difficulties the post-Vatican II Church has had with some scandalous episodes involving its priests in, the, in their parishes. Uh, particular, this article referred to a 1998 uh, situation in Dallas where there was about a $23 million settlement involving a lawsuit. Uh, the New York, Mex uh, New Mexico state, uh, I don't want to call it a state diocese, but the church in New Mexico, the post-Vatican II church in New Mexico was nearly narrowly averted bankruptcy. And the article uh, focused on the fact that uh, in many times, in many instances, when these very serious allegations and this criminal behavior takes place, uh, the, the local modern bishop will simply transfer the priest from one place to another place, the offending priest, and they referred to a cavalier rack, lack of responsibility. My first question is this. To what extent have these problems always been with us? And to what extent would you link them to the developments of Vatican II and what has transpired since then? Well, human nature being what it is, Julius, uh, problems have always been there, obviously. People uh, have a tendency to sin. Uh, were it not so, uh, we would find the world to be a very different place. The newspapers certainly would be filled with different news. And uh, we see the power of God's grace whenever we find virtue. But uh, Catholics also, I mean, are uh, subject to the ravages of original sin, even though that is removed from the soul by the power of the sacrament of baptism, by the power of Christ. Nonetheless, what are called the fomes peccati, that is sort of the aftermath of original sin, leaves the soul very much weakened and prone to uh, to the evils of pride and anger and lust and gluttony and so on. So, uh, yes, there always have been these tendencies, but the, the church has always sought to uh, promote virtue and to suppress vice in people. This is the, the role of the church is to sanctify, among others, to teach, to govern, and to sanctify by the power of Christ. Now, we find that since Vatican II, which was the general council that took place in Rome from 1962 to 1965, <clears throat> there has been a kind of explosion of this immorality, even among the clergy, in the modern changed church. And people sometimes ask, well, wasn't it always this way? And the answer is no, it wasn't always this way. And the reason it wasn't always this way is because the church was very, very careful before. So you're saying this is a particularly modern, contemporary phenomenon. Yes, uh, which has a great deal to do with the changes that came in with Vatican II. You see, in former days, uh, seminarians would go through years and years of training, and it was very arduous training. And during those years, their characters uh, were scrutinized very closely to see if they were suitable for the priesthood. And a man who is going to... Uh, be ordained a priest has to make a vow of celibacy and he has to live that vow very faithfully and he has to stand up under a lot of pressures from society but also pressures from within you know his own loneliness and so on and they need men who are able to, to stand up to those pressures uh, just as in the modern military you have the navy seals and you have the rangers and you have men who are trained to carry out uh, you know, very special tasks, and they have to have a certain quality. So the Catholic priesthood also looked for these qualities in men who, over the long term, could stand firm against pressures and 
and maintain their integrity and dignity. But uh, nowadays, in the modern seminary training after Vatican II, uh, I think you'll find that those safeguards have been largely removed. In fact, it is the seminarians who keep the old devotions and the devotions which keep them steady and strong throughout the temptations of life are the ones who are looked upon with suspicion. And it is those who've gotten kind of in touch with their inner child and those who, uh, you know, have, have uh, kind of looked upon not so much the spiritual life but replaced it with psychology, especially self-fulfillment and self realization and, and self-everything, all, all the New Age uh, buzzwords, they're the ones who are looked upon as the ideal seminarians today. And uh, it's, it's normal that they're going to, uh, you know, have these, these ideas that when they have a strong feeling that rather than fight it, they should give in to it. I'm not saying that's true of all of them, all of the modern seminarians, but unfortunately it's all too true of many of them so that we find scandals not only involving seminarians, we find scandals involving Novus Ordo, that is, modern priests, uh, even modern bishops, bishops yeah. have been disgraced. And uh, this has made uh, headlines worldwide about the, uh, the impure antics, even of some of the modern bishops. I guess the, the thing which has really been a source of scandal and discouragement uh, is the attitude that the the hierarchy, the modern hierarchy, takes when one of these unfortunate inf incidents occurs? It'll, it'll almost be like, well, you know, this individual now is undergoing counseling, and in a few weeks he'll assume uh, assume a new post. Mm -hmm. When there's a very serious crime, a multi-million dollar civil lawsuit, mm -hmm. how would this have ha been handled, say? in the 18th century or the 1930s or the 1920s as opposed to how it's being handled today? Well, before Vatican II, these uh, crimes were looked upon as mortal sins. Uh, the individual was responsible for what he did, and the diocese would accept responsibility for the individual because the diocese would say, well, we, tr we trained him, we scrutinized his character, we ordained him, we put him in this position, and he abused the authority we gave him to uh, to hurt people. Um, and so, uh, you know, but this didn't happen that often because, because the diocese was willing to accept responsibility. Uh, it did, and it exercised its authority in former times to make sure that worthy priests uh, were in positions of responsibility for souls. This doesn't mean all of them were absolute saints. Quite, that's not so at all, we know, but they're still human beings, and they still had human foibles uh, before Vatican II, you know. But nonetheless, nowadays there's been a fundamental shift in the whole attitude toward these crimes. Now it's, it's just a psychological aberration, you know, and, and, and it's, it's not that anyone's really, really responsible for this kind of thing. It's just that somebody needs, as you say, counseling and everything will be all right. Mm -hmm. And so there's no sense of the, the immorality, let's say, of it. You know, you don't hear sin talked about too much anymore, mm -hmm. the word sin. That is to say, uh, a, a man or a woman uh, violating the law of God. Uh, this, is, this is not the, the major problem that the Novus Ordo Church faced. It's, it's some kind of psychological aberrance that we have to deal with by psychology and psychoanalysis and, and, uh, and, and treatment. Um, the, the fact is, however, that we're dealing with a human will that is perverse. And it has to be judged as such. Uh, people need, once again, to discover the sense of guilt for, for uh, doing what is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean uh, that they should be guilt-ridden in, in, uh, in the modern sense of the term, but I mean they, they have to accept responsibility and acknowledge that they're wrong and ask for forgiveness with a firm purpose of amendment for the future. This is something that seems to be forgotten in the modern church as they go into more and more the psychological idea. Of and I, I think what's significant, Father, too, is that if, if someone were accused of one of these terrible crimes and there was a, a, a substance to it and he admitted it, my sense is that, although I was not yet alive, but say in the 1940s or the 1930s, you were finished. You would either be uh, uh, exiled somewhere or be defrocked. You would never hold any sensitive position again or period. Am I correct? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, a priest who would fall into this uh, 
vice of impurity would be sent to a monastery for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, he would not be allowed to deal with the public, and uh, he would actually do penance. Mm -hmm. um, Pope Pius XI uh, took uh, an action which today would be considered very extreme. But when you see the evils that, that the, these uh, dioceses are dealing with and these apparent priests and how much damage they do, you can understand that Pope Pius XI was not going to mess around or fool mm -hmm. around with this. Uh, he had a priest executed by firing squad in the Vatican because that priest had uh, abused a child, sexually abused a child. This was a crime so grave in the eyes of the church that it was worthy of death. And of course, I, I actually feel sorry for the priests and the bishops today who are falling into these crimes and then have no help whatsoever uh, except to be sent to counseling somewhere for a, a year and then sent off to another parish to do this again to another child. That's a horrible thing and we know who's responsible for this. The authorities who are supposed to prevent this are the ones who are ultimately are going to bear the responsibility before the judgment seat of God for what has happened to these children. What would you... No, but, I mean, this priest had the opportunity to repent of what he'd done, acknowledge that it was a capital crime, uh, to confess his sins, to be absolved, and to prepare himself to meet, to meet his maker and, and to face the judgment seat of Christ. And if he were truly repentant for what he had done, he would have said, yes, what I've done to this child is a crime worthy of death. But I nowadays, right. uh, nowadays they have no sense of that whatsoever. They leave behind them this, well, this wake of poor children who have been damaged for life by, by this experience. And they say, well, what are you going to do? I, I just had a, uh, you know, I got up on the wrong side of the bed that morning. I didn't have my morning coffee. Oh. I'm exaggerating. I don't mean to sound cavalier. No, I understand, but it is, it's, it's true. I it's pity these clergymen like who are left with no spiritual support by what has happened in the church since Vatican II. They're, they're also victims, victims of what has happened. Father, what would your counsel and advice be to the, the Catholics who are in the pews, who are trying to practice their faith, who have been taught that this is the one true faith, who have a, who place, and, and properly so, the clergy on a, on a different pedestal, and, and they see this happen and they're, they're shaken to a certain extent. Is there any consolation you can offer them? Well, I would tell the, the people who are going to the modern churches that they, they really cannot place the priests there on a pedestal because the priests refuse to be on the pedestal. Now, to be on a pedestal in the sense of uh, glorifying oneself is wrong. We know that. Right? But to be on the pedestal in the sense that you realize that because of your position, you have to uh, maintain self-control, dignity, integrity, and you cannot allow yourself uh, weaknesses, that you have to stand firm against the temptations to impurity and dishonesty and anger and so on, that more is expected of you. Uh, being on the pedestal in that sense, that, that you hold yourself to a higher standard, not self-esteem, which means that you're just intrinsically perfect and wonderful, but self-respect, that you want to live up to a higher standard so as to inspire others and, and want them also to, to live according to a higher standard of living, then that's a good thing. But since Vatican II, again, the, the whole notion of the priest is, well, let's get down with the people, let's take the colors off, let's uh, break down distinctions between us and the people. All the people are priests, and we're just ordinary people. And the priests don't want to be any different. They just want to blend in. They want to be able to hug and kiss the ladies outside the church doors on Sundays. and and uh, go to wedding receptions and, and dance with everybody else and drink with everybody else and just be one of the boys. Mm -hmm. And if you take someone with that attitude, a priest with that attitude, and you, you know, have the old idea of the priesthood that it demands more of a man, and you have the priest who doesn't see it that way, then you're going to inevitably be disappointed in the way he behaves and you're going to be scandalized by his behavior. <laughs> what the people need to do, of course, is reject this Novus Ordo entirely and tell the priest, look, if you are going to be a priest, you have to live up to those standards. You have to be like an apostle. You have to be like one of the early martyrs who uh, wants to serve Christ exclusively and not serve yourself and not have a nine-to-five job and be just one of the boys. You're watching what Catholics believe.
Father Jenkins, another issue which is uh, currently very much before the public is the issue of partial birth abortion. Uh, the abortion issue has not died down. The partial birth issue is one which uh, many, many people may not even be aware of what is involved in this procedure, but it is a procedure which was signed into law by the President. It is currently uh, being tested. The Congress over, uh, is attempting to ban it. They overrode the presidential veto now it is in the Senate. Uh, maybe you could uh, refresh people's minds a little bit in what really is involved with partial birth abortion. Well, it's so gruesome, I hesitate to get into any detail on it. It's, it's basically the matter of uh, murdering a child. Um, that is to say, leaving the, the head of the child alone in the woman's body, and then, I mean, it's horrible to say it, much more horrible to do it, to actually take a scissors and ram it into the back of the skull, uh, under the base of the skull of the child, and then suck its brains out by, by suction machine, and then crush the skull and then uh, deliver the, the child's head uh, with the rest of the body. Uh, it's murder. It's a, it's a gruesome act. Now imagine, imagine if uh, we decided in our country that criminals who were guilty of mass murder, I'm talking about people who might have murdered 10, 20, 30 people, tortured them to death, okay, buried their, their bodies under their homes and so on. We've seen examples of this in the not too distant past, uh, these gruesome mass murders. If, if we were to say that we were going to take those people, just two or three of them, and make an example out of them by ramming scissors up the base of their skulls and then sucking their brains out. We were going to execute them this way. It'd be a public You'd imagine that the hue and cry about how inhuman that would be. And of course it is inhuman. But to do this uh, to, to little children, to deliver their bodies up to the neck and then uh, pierce their skulls and, and uh, suck their brains out, I mean, this is so gruesome. You'd have to be an absolute devil to do this. You'd have to be a monster to do something like this. And yet, this is promoted, and uh, the President of the United States, uh, Bill Clinton, says this is even compassionate to, uh, to have this done. Well, you know, to me what's so shocking is what kind of a doctor mm -hmm. who, is, uh, who is actually, it's almost a vocation toward, toward helping the sick, mm -hmm. toward saving lives, could do something like this where he is performing murders which would have been undreamt of even by Hitler. Well, you know, the idea behind that attitude is that pregnancy itself is a pathological, oh. uh, that it is a sickness. And, uh, I mean, you can basically treat any sickness. Um, but this is the attitude many of, unfortunately, many of the doctors uh, have that uh, pregnancy itself uh, means that there's something wrong with a woman. And, and you have to terminate that pregnancy to, to make her healthy or make her well again. Mm -hmm. This is the anti-life attitude that is um, unfortunately more and more prevalent in certain circles today with the uh, no population growth and zero population growth crowd. You know? But um, this is so, so evil, this is so horrible that it bodes very ill for, uh, for society and, and the fact that so many of our American people don't rise up and say, no, we will not tolerate this. Uh, we, we see where all this is leading now and we're horrified by it. The fact that so, so few are willing to do that uh, makes us wonder, well, what, is, what does the future hold? Now, uh, we understand that the United States Congress has, by a wide margin, uh, voted to overturn the veto of Bill Clinton. Uh, the houses uh, of government in America actually voted to make partial birth abortion, abortion illegal, and Bill Clinton vetoed the bill, and uh, saying that it was compassionate to have this done under certain circumstances for certain women. <laughs> and uh, I understand that just recently now the, uh, the American House of Representatives has voted wi by a wide margin to overturn that veto. Now it's before the Senate. And that it's before the Senate. We'll see what happens. This at least is encouraging that uh, so many congressmen see the evil of this, and regardless of what other political views they may have, they recognize this, this is not to be tolerated. You mentioned about this boding ill for the country, that something like this is permitted. 
uh, encouraged in a, in a, well, I should say a perverse way by the president when he says this is an act of compassion. It's like saying, I'm doing this for your own good. I'm going to stick a knife in your throat. I'm being very compassionate. Uh, th there's a theological point, which maybe you could uh, shed some light on. It's that uh, countries cease to exist after this world is over. Uh, human beings do not. Therefore, since God is just, countries will be brought to justice for their transgressions against divine law. Now we're looking, literally, the Gentiles have raged and desired vain things. What are the theological implications of something like this? What are the consequences we may experience? Well, the only things that are going to survive this world are uh, the human soul and its uh, love for God. I mean, even faith and hope will fall away because uh, there will exist heaven and hell in the end. And uh, in heaven, as in hell, there is no faith needed. And in heaven, there is no faith because you see God. You don't need to believe anymore. You know. Mm -hmm. And there's no hope in heaven because you have what you hoped for. You possess it. And in hell, there is no hope because you can never have what you were created for, and that is the possession of God. But the love of God will remain in heaven uh, perfectly forever and ever. And now nations cannot pass out of this life, and, but this means that God judges them during this world's existence. God actually rewards and punish nations, punishes nations during this, this world's uh, span. So in other words, the fate of nations is tied to the morality of nations. And the morality is determined by the public law. What kind of laws govern the people? Even if the people don't live up to those laws, at least the ideal is there of what is right and what is wrong. As we've seen too often when there are good laws that people disregard and uh, the authority doesn't enforce them. But what makes the nation in the first place a nation acceptable to God is if it has laws that are based upon truth and justice. And uh, in the past in our country, uh, this has largely been the case. Uh, the natural law was held up even by our founding fathers as a standard by which we should form the, the laws of our land. But unfortunately, that has been scrapped in recent times. Uh, by our legislators and by our courts. And the, the new standard is uh, whatever is politically expedient, unfortunately. In other words, it will get to the point, that it seems, where only voters have rights. Unborn children don't vote, and therefore they simply have no rights. Father Jenkins, the, uh, an, an, an area which has been, again, subject to intense media scrutiny is the, the president's behavior, personal behavior. Uh, and the whole question is, uh, does this really matter? Do, does anyone really care what he does in his private life? Does it affect the way he governs? Uh, and I guess the, the corollaries to that, or rather the, the following questions would be, what about the notion of demoralization? Mm -hmm. What about the notion of scandal? And what about uh, the fallout, which has included uh, just really obscene songs which we hear on the radios ad infinitum, which, which mock, which ridicule not only the president, but the office of the presidency? Well, the character of leaders has a profound impact on the society. Um, a, a leader's character cannot be something neutral. Either it's going to be good or it's going to be bad, just because of the spotlight the leader is in and the dis weight, the gravity of the decisions he has to make, and the many, many people who are affected by those decisions. So uh, there is a duty incumbent upon leaders to present a good example, to be kind of the ideal of what they'd like every American to be. Uh, you know, it used to be uh, a great thing to say every child in America can has the possibility of growing up to be the president of the United States, you know, and this was a wonderful thing. There are very few children now who have any desire to be the president of the United States. Um, the office has been so degraded. Uh, unfortunately, this is true in the Novus Ordo Church with the office of bishop and priest, too. The office has been so degraded that very few children grow up with this idealistic notion of wanting to be this person, wanting to hold this office, wanting to to be in a position to do great things for God or do great things for our, for our country. 
they look upon these offices now as being possessed by men who are basically self-serving or playing to the gallery. So we have to try to restore this concept of responsibility in, in the leaders of our land and the leaders of our church and demand that they live up to their responsibilities and be the type of people that everyone should, should want to be. You've been watching what Catholics 